All right. Okay, recharged. We want to pick up where we left off and show you how to tile the, uh, a fault, a rectangular fault, into a bunch of, of patches. And to do that, we will uh, go to input. Oh, okay, Shinji's going to relaunch Coulomb. I didn't know you weren't ready. We'll see if Shinji's little, little portable computer can handle this. If not, we'll switch to his larger one. OK, so we're going to open most recent input file, because I think that was the no, I didn't. Oh, because you just launched. There wasn't a file. <laughs> ah, that's a good point. TH, example 2 TH. All right, so that's what should be on your screen. All right, and now we're going to go to Functions, Tools, Taper or Subdivide Fault Slip again. Ready? OK. And now, rather than linear, t linear tapering, we're going to do splitting. I'm sorry that we have three different names for the identical thing. We call it splitting, tiling, and, <laughs> and subdividing. So that was our oversight. But if you can push the radio button under splitting, and let's change that to um, 7 by 3. We'll choose 7 patches along strike and 3 down dip. And when you've done that, then click OK. And then you should get that pattern. So now we've got 21 patches of slip. Steve? Oh, sorry. Oh. <coughs> now, Shinji's just going to open. So now let's, let's, let's all save that file. So in the input menu, Save input file as INP, because I want you to be able to see this file. And we'll call it junk.INP, or you could call it whatever you want. All right. And now <coughs> let's um, go back to the uh, MATLAB. Well, let me use Whoa. the text editor. Okay. Oh, you yeah. can open that in the MATLAB text editor. You can open it in any text editor. Or you don't even have to. You can just look at the, at the screen here and look at Shinji's. Yeah. Okay. And what I want you to see is we put it, we had an input file that had two meters of reverse slip and no right lateral slip. So what it's done is it's created all these patches, <coughs> and it's given them all that same slip. So if you just ran this file, it would obviously give you exactly the same result. But it would just be a slower way of getting there, because it has to calculate them for every patch. But the idea is that now you go in there and replace this with the slip that you want. So you, you get a variable slip source model, such as from Yugi Yagi's, Yagi's website or wherever, or some <coughs> somebody who's done some work on Parkfield or whatever you want, and you would just go in there and put in this, the appropriate slip so that you can get a variable slip model. So the two-step process then for tiling is to create the patches and then to put in the slip that you want. Jessica? If you want to tile the slip model, do you need to make a file like this out of it, or can you load it in some other way? The way we have, the filter that we built in is through Martin Mai's source model database. And so, and we'll show you how to do this. Martin Mai at Eteha Zurich has created a, a inventory of 150 variable slip files. And Coulomb will read those. Or if you have your own metrics format, uh, you can, well, convert that into Excel or just 
text, type of delimited text file, and then MATLAB can read that file. Okay. And then that you can manipulate that on the MATLAB command menu. Yeah, it was actually already in there, but I just realized I didn't even see Yeah, well, we could make some kind of filter. What we should do is make a filter for that, because we haven't really done that. So you have to kind of beat it into submission right now. And uh, Martin Mai's database is the one place where we've made it so that sources that have a thousand patches you can just instantly swallow whole in Coulomb. And so, so, you know, part of the message is if you have a variable slip model, you should submit it. For everybody here who's producing them, you should submit them to Martin Mai with a little bit of trouble, you know, so that you get it into his format. The advantage is um, it's going to vastly increase the use of your file because everybody has access to it and they all have references and whatnot. <coughs> Right. So what Steve is saying is, in, in Coulomb, you don't uh, implement a width and a length. You have a start and finish point, and then you have the top and bottom vertical dimension, which controls the width of the fault. And that's true. And um, I will show you that in a certain case, you can overcome that. But that is a general weakness of the way we've done it. And in fact, it creates a problem. If you have a dike or a Decoma fault that has zero degree dip, you can't actually put that in Coulomb because top and bottom have the same dimension. So you have to put a tiny bit of dip and then you can do it. So it is kind of a hassle in that way. All right, le th that's great. Let's go back to page where it's shown in, in graphical form because that's really an important thing. So if you go to page 15, you can see start x, y, and finish x and y. And then in the cross-section view, you can see what each one of these things mean. So top is the, is the vertical distance from the Earth's surface to the top of the fault. Bottom is the vertical distance to the bottom of the fault. So you can see that width is not defined directly. And <coughs> that the x position is on the vertical projection to the top of the fault, not the up dip projection to the top of the fault. So, you know, to some extent these things are arbitrary and this is an inheritance from the Okada 1992 formula which Coulomb uses, this, this way of defining geometry. But let me show you a way to get um, files, in, input files into Coulomb where you can put in um, the width and length. And it's very, very useful when you're starting with a global CMT uh, catalog information or something else. So what I'd like you to do now is go to input and um, choose a build input file from lat and long map. And now you have a, a big dialog box. Has everybody got that one up? Okay, so build input from, it says build input from lat and lawn map is the in, in lat and lawn map. So that one you hadn't used before. Okay. So what it does is it gives you a reference point and the Latin lawn boundaries of the grid area, which Coulomb needs if it's going to be able to go toggle between Cartesian and um, Latin lawn values. And it, it's given some kind of um, uh, value. This is kind of interesting, Shinji, because we didn't, pr it, it hasn't filled those in. So presumably that's because we didn't previously have a yeah. value in there. So let's just put some numbers in to x and y start, x and y finish. Let's put um, for x minus 60. What? Or you, you it's a long-term latitude coordinate. You missed a point? 
No, 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 down there where it says X start, Y start. No, this is, should be calculated. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, all right, my mistake. So what it's doing is um, that is just the study area. So if we choose those as the limit of our grid, what it's going to calculate in X, Y start, blah, 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 is the um, boundary of the study area. You know, it's somewhat, we shouldn't really call those X and Y start and X and Y finish because those are the words we use for the fault ends. That's sort of, okay. That's something, that's a little thing we should fix. So hit calculate on top there. And now it's filled in the equivalent Cartesian values for those latitude and longitudes given the reference point. So what that means is that anything, that, that the zero, zero Cartesian value is at that particular reference point lat long. All right, now we're going to look down at where it says fault elements. And no, it's add to map. Oh, okay, sorry, add to map is next. So click add to map, and what you're going to get is a grid area with no fault in it. Slide it over a little so that, or, yeah, perfect. Okay, now what I'd like you to do is look at page 21 in your manual. And by the way, you're on page 21 in the manual. It's only 56 pages. <laughs> so you're one third of the way through. You're trucking. Okay, and what I want you to see is this diagram on the right hand side, which shows the two ways you can enter the information. And one is where it says start point per Aki Richards reference, which has that typical point, which for the right hand rule puts the dip in the direction of my right hand. And the other one is more natural when you come in with a global CMT or uh, NEIC uh, um, solution, which is kind of, you know, CMT is the center of the slip area. So naturally, you'd want that dot to be the center of the fault. So you can choose one or the other. And so you can see that th those are the, the two radio buttons that represent those two choices on page 21. So let's choose fault center because that's, let's say, what you're more likely to come in with. And so now you would take from the CMT catalog the latitude and longitude, the depth, the length, width, and moment magnitude that you would get from the CMT catalog, and then its focal information, strike, dip, and rake. And so in answer to Steve's question, here is a case where you are actually able to apply length and width. So you know, this is what you're likely going to do right after a large earthquake has occurred that, that uh, uh, piqued your interest. You're going to go to one of those websites, NEIC or CMT. You're going to grab that information and you're going to stick that in and you're going to say, hey, I don't have any details, but I want to get something that's approximately right. And so you'll just grab that stuff and put it in here. Now, what you're not going to get from the CMT catalog is the length and width. What you're going to get instead and the slip. You're only going to get the moment, the strike, dip, and rake, and of course you're going to get two sets, nodal plane one and two, and you're going to have to decide which one you want to try or both. So how do you go from a moment to the proper length and width? How do you scale this, in other words, so it's a reasonable source? So what Shinji's created here is an option called from empirical relations. So why don't you click that? And now what it does is you go up there and you put the magnitude and the fault type. So let's pull down that all faults to uh, reverse. Okay. So now it says, okay, the, from empirical relations between magnitude and the geometry, what should the length and width of it be? So now you'll hit calculate and you'll get numbers. And so this is going to make sure that these numbers aren't necessarily going to be right, but they're going to be typical of the faults of interest. The one caveat I have here is that um, it's giving too deep a fault for very large strike-slip events. So we need to work on this calculator to make it uh, properly appropriate. So this is just a warning. If you put in a magnitude 8, it won't be 10 kilometers wide. Right. So now, once you've seen those numbers in there, then you hit Apply. And then close. And then close that, uh, di that box. The, and so what you've done is you've just opened and then closed the empirical geometry calculator. And notice 
that in the fault elements, those two numbers are now in those boxes where you had previously pushed from empirical relations. Now what it's going to do is, given that information, the strike, the dip, the rake, the length and the width, it's going to calculate for you start X and Y, finish X and Y. It's going to calculate for you the proper amount of slip also. So click calc. Is not visible? Hmm. That's interesting. You're just you're using a PC? Okay. So here, you've been... Yeah, let me, let me... Let's, let's, let's redo yeah. it. Thank you. You don't have to do that. So we're just going to go through this process again, just so you see it. So Shinji did calc and add to map in the study area. Slow down. And then, and then we're going to choose fault center. Then he's going to choose from empirical relations. And just for fun, let's change the magnitude so we see numbers change. 7.3, I don't know. And reverse. So now it's much bigger. And Shinji it's hits. over the top, but it's OK. You know, the way. Oh, yeah. So he hits apply and then close. And then you can see those, those numbers, 76 and 31, for the length and width are there. And now we're going to hit calculate again. Well, and actually, this is really useful to see. It's given us an error message. And that error message happens because we are working with, the, with a point. So in cross-section, what we had is we had a point here. So let's think of this as a, a focal mechanism for our thrust fault. And we've made it really big. And because it's in the center and the width, it's popped out of the ground. Night of the living dead. <laughs> so it says change the source depth. So what Shinji's going to do now This is the big one. This is a 7.3. Um, so he's going to change the source depth so we get it lower. And then add to map. All right, so then he's hit calculate and finally add the map. And so here's our source. Are you getting something that looks like that? You may have put in a smaller uh, source area than, than we did. And the um, symbology is the same as what you've seen before in terms of green and red and black lines. The difference is it's got a blue dot. And that blue dot was the latitude and longitude that you put in. So that you can kind of have a, a guide for yourself that this is you put in the center of the rupture area. And we won't do it, but obviously you would just go input, save file, and you have this file that you've created. So the important thing is you can see that it's very easy to go from catalog information to a, a reasonable source. And you know your next stop on this is the next thing you might want to do is say, OK, well, now I'll taper it. It'll gonna be more realistic if I do that. So I would just go functions, tools, taper, taper, overlay. And I would create a tapered version of the thing. And then I would save that. Yes? It's the sent, it's it, go to page 21 in the manual. So we've chosen the bottom of these two options, fault center reference point. So it's going to be in the geometrical center of the rupture area. If you had chosen the top one, the Aki Richards convention, then it would be in the uh, lower right hand corner because for the right hand rule, it's dipping off that way. That's right. And so the what the 0, 0 is, that represents 0, 0 is the latitude and longitude of the reference point. So that in this example, that 0, 0 point happened to be 130 degrees 0.2 east longitude and 33.8. It's not the 0, 0 of the fall.
because what Coulomb needs to make this transition between x and y and lat ln are those reference points. So we built that in. Yeah, Jessica. Let's try that. So, uh, um, well, you need to, we need to save it first and reopen it. To, to push the OK button and then the, the different dialogs that I deleted, uh, erased. You know what I mean? Because yeah, but she's, I think what she's saying is now she's going functions, tools, well, taper. First, we have to go. Oh, uh, OK. Uh, all right, now let's go functions, tools, taper. Yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah. did give an error message. Maybe what we need to do is to save the file yeah. and well, then save that. it and then open it. I think that's probably what's happening. Do you want to demonstrate um, the source MOD? Yeah, just just briefly. Okay. Yeah. Now, since we're not online, you're not online. Shinji is. Um, you can't go to the uh, Martin Mai's website to download this file. But if you go to page 22 in the manual, you can see exactly what you will find there. And Shinji's going to demonstrate. You don't actually even have to download it. I think you should just open the SRC. I think it'll take too much time to do that. But all right, here's what you will see if you go to their website and you go to the downloads spot. And what you will be taking is SRC MOD means is a shorthand for source model. And notice that this is created to work with MATLAB, which is wonderful. Um, and the only thing that's important is when you save it, save it as a binary file, not as a text file. And, and the process for downloading it is explained on tw page 21 and 22 of the uh, um, manual. And then what, what you're going to do then is um, use a plug-in and that'll be our, the first plugin we've encountered in the class. Plugins are little command scripts that go into the uh, MATLAB command windows. Basically, they're, they're things that are not yet ready for prime time in the main program, but that Shinji has created so that we can uh, work with things. So what? So now, going back to Coulomb, why don't you just close the okay. uh, browser? It's in your way. OK. So it's what you're going to write in here is uh, SRC MOD to Coulomb. And now here is all, here are all the sources. Why don't you just scroll them so people can see. It's just incredible how much is there. You know, for, you know there may be uh, 12 different Landers sources and 10 different uh, Kobe's, et cetera. And lots of others. Uh, Lander. So Wall. let's no, no. Let's take something that's a little smaller. No, I think it's Landers is okay. Okay. Try that. And, uh, <coughs> oh, it's 186. All right, Wall. if you want to. Uh -huh. um, okay. That's a. No, they no, don't have this have file. The reason why we didn't put the file in is because the file will go obsolete. And so we want you to go get, get in the habit of going to his website because then you get the most updated, uh, updated version of things. And um, uh, which one? Uh, this one. All right, now let's. You want to look at it in 3D because they can't really see anything. It's then. Too big, probably. What? Too well, sign. you chose it. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Let's change that. Um. <laughs> He's yeah. going to choose another one. 
Let, let's choose uh, Whittier, Whittier Narrows. <laughs> there you go. It just uh, left. You just, you just. When? I saw it a moment ago. There we go. It's not quite as large. Yeah. Hundred. Okay, now if we go to functions and then um, grid 3D view, we'll see these 100 patches colored by their slip. By the way, you notice that the black line is well apart from, the, uh, from this. For some reason, that means that the depth in this is probably at zero somewhere. Maybe it's at 30 or something. Okay, so now Shinji will... Uh, yeah, okay, stop it there. And zoom in. So you can see, for example, it's a little, it's kind of hard to see what's what, I mean, what's uh, north. But they all the patches have the same rake in this particular model. They're all pure dip slip, pure reverse slip but the slip is quite variable. But there are other models in here where the rake varies, and you'll see that all that variation in rake. So it's a very, very useful thing to be able to grab these because, you know, it takes us about a day to make a model for Coulomb that way. So we've let Martin and Mai do all the hard work here. Another comment I'd like to make in terms of a model like this is, or two comments. First, my advice is whenever you work in Coulomb, start really simple. In other words, even if you have a variable slip model for the Whittier Narrows, start with a rectangle, maybe with simple tapered slip, and explore things before you work with 100 patches. Because only when you work in that very schematic level do you understand the basic relationships. If you start with the really complex beast, you never really quite know what's controlling what. So we've tried to make Coulomb a very easy tool to do your exploration. So you understand, well, what is just plain um, uniform slip do like I showed you in those cross sections in the slideshow. The other thing I want to say, and Shinji, if you could go back to the map of the where you just were of the yeah of the oh you're adding things to it oh yeah, Shinji cool. is moving ahead here, but we're not really there yet. Okay. I just want to see the distribution of slip, the the the, the 3D view, 3D uh, view. All right. Um, oh, you have to change change all that back. Time. Okay, which is that in these variable slip models, obviously we don't really know the distribution of slip, and whatever we, whatever somebody has produced there has large errors. It's very important that, at minimum, you should not make no stress calculations closer than the kind of the spacing of these patches, because you're you're going to see errors associated with it. If you go closer than the patch spacing, we don't really have that resolution. And your results will be better if you stay farther away. Do you understand what I mean? The kind of sphere of influence of each one of these patches is such that you should never get closer than the patch spacing. So if you're going to make measurements of a nearby fault, that in this, if this patch side is two by two, you should not look at faults closer than two kilometers or perhaps five kilometers from the surface. Because you're just dealing with errors in the slip being mapped into stress. Okay, if you look at page 22, you'll also see that there's a way in Coulomb that if you wanted to bring in the figure on the right, three different Martin My variable slip models and get them into one input file, there's another plugin that you'd use for that. So you don't have to do one at a time. Because quite often there are two earthquakes closely spaced, you want to use the slip of the com or the stress is produced by their combination. So, um Every time that we want to use the plugin function, we just type on the command window. So we yeah, we'll, we will do set. some more plugins. Yeah, that was because they're not doing it and they're just watching you do it. We don't have to worry about it. But in, in a few minutes, we'll be doing plugins together. And, uh, and then you'll see how they work. Okay, so where you've been now is you now know everything we know about how to input files and manipulate input files in Coulomb. And where we're headed now is three different things. 
over the rest of the day. The first is how you get coastline files, active fault files, and earthquake catalogs into the maps, which are very useful to, uh, to allow you to see what's going on. Then the next thing we'll do is look at displacements and deformation, like strains and vectors. And the next, we'll look at the stress interaction. So that's kind of where we're headed. And where we are in the manual is the start of the chapter on overlays on page 23. And so if you go to that, you'll see the uh, map information that's in many of the tutorial files that is needed so that you can work in lat lawn. And if you don't have that in an input file, you can always create it. And it also shows you that there is this uh, uh, NOAA coastline extractor, the National Geophysical Data Center coastline extractor. So if you're, in, if you're working in an area and you don't have any files for the coastline or the lakes, you can just go to this website and download it, and Coulomb will read those files. So that's quite convenient, and we just explained how to do that. So now what I'd like to do is build up an example where we use coastlines, active faults, earthquakes, and Coulomb sources, and we'll work from the Bay Area. So what I'd like you to do is to go to Input and choose example sfbayarea.imp, open existing input file. You see it, example sfbayarea.imp, OK. OK. So now what we want to do is switch this to a uh, lat lawn format. And so if you use the right, um, you, can, you can use the preferences menu. All right, we'll do the preferences menu this time just so you see it. So if you go to input, preferences, and then down at the bottom it says coordinate and move from Cartesian and pull it down to lawn lat and release. It should say lawn lat and OK. But with the preferences, yeah, OK, perfect. So now, now you should see that same map, but it should be lawn lat. Is that what you've seen? OK. Now we're going to look at the overlay menu kind of for the first time. And you're going to want to go to coastline. All right. And you're going to choose. California, there's two California coastlines, DI for intermediate resolution and DH for high resolution. And we'll use DI, the, the, inter, the, the smaller file. And the neg means that's are just shorthand that um, negative uh, longi Western longitudes are representative as minus numbers, negatives, because some catalogs have different formats for that. Say, so, OK. And then you get this answer where it says, are you expecting them to be negative or not? And the answer should be no. Personally, I never remember the right answer, so I try it both ways until it shows up <laughs> on a map. And you should see something like this. OK, so obviously that's the uh, California coastline. And now you've got that in, in your map. All right, now let's try. Um, Active faults. So go to overlay menu again and go down. Notice, by the way, that coastline is checked. If Shinji unchecked it, it would disappear. And if we went back again and checked it, it would show up again. So you can toggle them on and off. You can also clear them out altogether if you want to use something else. But that's very convenient. So overlay, active faults. And we have an active fault folder. This just tells you the format, because you will possibly be making these yourselves if you're working in an area that doesn't have an available active fault file. So that just shows you what your options are and say OK. And then it, you can, it opens the active fault file. And you can see what we've put in there. It's a hodgepodge of, don't, don't do it yet, California, Japan, um, and Turkey. We have all of Turkey plus the different two different interpretations of the Marmara Sea faults. And of course, we'd love to keep adding more files. If people sent us them, we would just put them in the, in the Coulomb uh, download files. But in any event, choose 
California fault long lat. So that's all of California, and it's filtering that for the part of California in our area. And there you can see the faults. And remember how I showed you in the beginning in the preferences menu, you could change the color and line thickness of these faults if you wanted to. Well, I'm not going to, but I just want to see, uh, want you to see that that's something that you can change. You don't have to bring it into Illustrator or something to change those kind of features. All right, and finally, let's now put an earthquake catalog in. So overlay again and choose earthquakes. Okay. Now, now you get a select. You get an er, se select the format, and I want you to just scroll through, and and uh, you can see that we put in a lot of different formats of catalogs that we happen to have worked with or thought that you should encounter, um, such as the typical ones coming from the USGS, the National Turkish one, uh, National Japanese ones, NIED. Uh, HypoDD, TomoDD, etc. SOSIS is an underwater catalog. And, um, so the catalog it, is all that matters is the format that you choose there matches the catalog that you've got. And in our case, the format we want is NCSN readable, Northern California Seismic Network readable format. So click on that. People can see it. Hmm? No, you don't see it? All right, we'll kind of all see if he can help you. There is a problem that we've encountered in MATLAB 7.4 and PowerPC Max, but that isn't a PowerPC Max. So that, that is one um, problem that, that is built into MATLAB software that we've yet to overcome, but not a problem for Intel Max. Okay, so we're going to say OK here, and then we're going to find the catalog that has that same format, so NCSN readable. And by the way, you don't have to take it from here. You would go to the Northern, Fal Northern California Seismic Catalog website, and you would choose the readable format and download what you want, and then you would put that here. So these are just kind of starter catalogs. But you can, the idea is that you can go and grab what you want for the project you're working on. And say OK. And then you get this filter, an earthquake screening filter. And so you can see that you can screen it by time, location, magnitude, or depth. This is just a small chunk of the catalog. It's only got 300 earthquakes in it. So we'll just take the whole thing. But it's convenient to have this filter um, obviously, it's not going to plot earthquakes outside of the box. So if you don't change mat, uh, lat lon, or is that the box? You know, is that the that's the catalog max min? It's all ma automatically going to filter it within the box of interest, but not the other features. So we'll say OK. And now you can see that it's plotted the earthquakes. And in the, again, in the preferences menu, you could change the color or the circle and the circle size. What? What it, after you change the preferences, then you have to redo it. Do you, can you just toggle them on and off? Maybe if you just toggle them on and off, it'll do it. Did that help? Uncheck them and check them? Yeah, let me, let me do that. Um, the ch color? Change the color? Let's change the color and the, and the circle size for earthquakes just for fun. So we'll change it to uh, uh, 6. Oh, six? Yeah, make them bigger. Uh, too big? Too Four. Big. Five. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then. And now let's, yeah. Toggle. Yeah. yeah, it changed them. So, did that work for you? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, look, look what he did. So, everybody go to input and then preferences. And now let's just make them 10 in size. Point? 10, 0. 10, 10, yeah. So he's changed them to make them very, the circle size is very large and says OK. 
And now, for, to see it on the screen, he's got to uh, uncheck it and check it again. That's the tricky little step there. Now, obviously, if you're familiar with Illustrator, you can save this as a PDF file, open it in Illustrator, and select Same, Stroke, and Fill, and you can do it that way. But it's very convenient to be able to do it this way so you already have what you like and the colors are good. And often you do want to change colors because if you, later we're going to put a stress a gradient map on top of this, and the stress <laughs> gradients covers lots of colors, and it leaves you with fewer colors to choose from. You know, you may need gray or black or white or something like that. Um, going back to the overlay menu, since you go to the overlay menu, so notice that you can, um, in addition to unchecking and checking, you can also clear overlay data from menu. And that's used, for example, later when we were, you may want to change earthquake catalogs. So if you've got a catalog in there, you can't just uncheck it and put in a different catalog. You have to clear the other catalog out. So that's what that is used for. But for the most part, you'll be checking and unchecking as you want to keep things simpler or uh, uncomplicated. <laughs> now, you've done all this work. You've put in um, coastlines, faults, and earthquakes, and you want to save this whole deal without having to go through that laborious process again. And so this is where saving input files as .mat comes in handy. <clears throat> so hold down input and save input file as .mat. OK. And now we'll call, let's just call this sfbay.mat. Okay, now let's, let's actually load that just so you can see that yes, it actually does work. <coughs> so we're going to open an existing input file. And we're going to go find, slow down. And then um, you should find something that says sfbay, or if you're using a Mac, it'll say sfbay.mat, if that's what you called it, and say open. And there it is. And it's a tiny file. You could have a giant catalog in there, and it's still a tiny file. So that's very, very nice. All right, now here's something else that you might want to do with that file. Click on the map, Shinji. What if it's dimmed? Yeah. Is dimmed? Yeah. Uh, what is, so let's go to uh, input, input and then open. So you chose, Rob, open existing input file. And then is it possible that the, op the file format, which is the second Japanese line down there, it should say, it should give you either one, .imp or .mat. Maybe it had been set to .imp only. If it had been in .imp only, it'll gray out the .mat, but otherwise it should see it. Does it see it? Yes. Oh, you so the, the formats yeah, yeah. for the active file folder and the coastline yeah. folder are all explained. Yeah. And when you remember when you brought up, when you asked for an active fault, the first thing it did is gave you a little drop down box of the format for it. So it's really easy to bring, create them yourself.
you can see that up there. Go ahead. Okay. So why don't you? Okay. So reopen the .mat file. All right. So now here's something else that you that uh, it's a very common thing that you'll want to do. You'll have this active fault map, and you'll want to use those fault traces to make input sources. <coughs> so we're going to open this guy up again. So now um, let's say you wanted to make an input source for the San Gregorio fault. So what Shinji is going to do is show you how you can trace the map to make a source. So we're going to go to Overlay. And you see at the bottom of it, it says Trace and Put Faults into Input. So choose that option. OK. And again, it gives you instructions on um, how to position it. You're going to be using the right hand rule, left button for start, right button for end. Say OK. So Shinji, why don't you make a, some kind of San Gregorio trace? Yeah. Good. So see, yeah, move that aside just a little bit. So see, he's now created a trace. And he's just done it with his mouse, but it's you know within a kilometer or so or, or less of being accurate. So what it's got in there is the start and finish points. And now Shinji, to make it an active source, might want to put some the San Gregorio fault is, is probably a uh, oblique right lateral um, reverse fault. And it maybe dips uh, to the west. Yeah, 70 degrees sounds about right. To the west? Uh, to the east. To the east. Thank you. <laughs> and um, so then say OK. Or you, you don't have to put those exact numbers in. But there is the source. OK, so if you put it in, but you don't like it, and you want to change it. So basically, um, just, just uh, uh, click on the source and use the right button. I think maybe not the green. How about the red? So Shinji's just blown up the area where the fault is. Try the red. You've been using the green. You're red. Red. <laughs> Sorry for the inconvenience. Huh. This is helpful. Okay, what's another way we could we you can remove it? I guess the other way to do it is you just let's uh, yeah. no try that. It's just a little funky getting a hold of that fault. Now, so I think the best thing to do is to just reopen the input file and start the process again. Yeah. Oh, you mean you you got it to say delete source? Yeah, I got the uh, parameter menu and the delete fault, but on the map it shows. I didn't know that that had delete fault uh, on the parameter menu. Could you redraw the using 2D map view? I don't see a delete fault on the parameter change parameter no, menu. No, I put that. Oh, you did? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see Is it? Okay. I had some demand, I mean, requests from users. To do the, just yeah. that? I recently added. Uh, but so I think <laughs> the answer is to just reopen the input file, the .mat file, and start again. I'm sure that'll work. Because we're having a little bit of trouble, as you've pointed out, modifying the uh, source otherwise. OK, so let's keep moving, Shinji. So what I want to show you now 
is to go, to go back where we were. Uh, why don't you just, uh, let's just reopen the input file, the .mat file. So oh. open uh, most, yeah. Okay, great. All right, so let's just do this process one now more it's time. Now it's <laughs> yeah. yeah, all right. Yeah. So now let's, just, just so we get the hang of it. So overlay, <coughs> trace, and put faults into input map. Okay. Where? Anywhere. Okay. So this one is obviously uh, like one meter, and yeah, n yeah. And so we're just going to say OK. So now we have that source in there. Now what I want <coughs> to do is um, functions 3D view. Grid. Well, but before that, uh, we have to make it uh, Cartesian. Oh, yeah. So keep in mind that when you do a 3D view, it needs to be in Cartesian. It needs to be XY. So Shinji just switched it back to Cartesian. And now we go functions, grid, 3D view. And now play with it a little bit with the uh, swivel tool. Oh, now here's something of interest. It's got this dense grid up on top, because, uh, but we don't really need it. It interferes with our ability to see it. So let's experiment with changing that. So we're going to go to functions change parameters, grid size. Don't choose it yet. I wanted people to see that a little longer. All right, why don't you change that to uh, 20 by 20? If you didn't, if that went by too fast, we're gonna do it one more time. And say okay. And then we need to go functions. Let's just do 2D grid, 2, 2D map. Yeah, 2D map view. All right, so we're going to do that again, just so you see it. So functions, tools, no, excuse me, change parameters, grid size. <coughs> OK. And now we're going to make it, uh, yeah, I don't know, 25 by, yeah, 30 by 30. And then once you've made that change, you need to run 2D grid or 3D grid again to see it. OK, now let's do functions 3D grid. And you can swivel it around a bit. And you can even see through the earthquakes. You can look underneath it or upside down or whatever you want. And this is a good time to tell you about the difference between what we call dead figures, PDF figures, and live figures, which are .mat figures. A PDF, <coughs> once you've made it, it's a fixed vector object. A uh, .fig file, which is a MATLAB file, is a file that can be swiveled and rotated again. It's an extremely small file, but it's much more manipulable. So in the file menu, say save as. Shinji. File menu. File menu. Oh. Sorry. Save as. And is it? Does it say there? Save as FIG. Don't overwrite this one. Don't overwrite. Yeah. Main menu window. Remember. Do overwrite or do not. Don't. Don't, don't overwrite. Okay. So we're going to just call this. Main menu window? No, just junk or something. I thought you said don't over. Don't over. You mean change the name? Yeah. Change the name. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Not finding this problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Where do you put it, you mean? Or what, what do you call it? Okay, so let's do that again. Just start over completely. Yeah. So we're going to go up to the file menu. <laughs> I don't understand why you can't read that. <laughs> it's the next to the overlay, oh, overlay menu. Yeah. So what does it say in English there that he's choosing? File and fi save as. Save as. OK. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> save as. 
and then see it, pull down the lower menu so you can see the different type of figure uh, formats. The, yeah. Yeah. So dot .fig is something very specific to MATLAB, and it is a figure which is not just a vector two-dimensional map. It's the full three-dimensional representation, yet it's just as small. So it's very, very useful for you because you can save this thing, reopen it. It opens automatically in MATLAB, and you can spin things around again without having to recreate it. So first, go to the cat, um, home directory. OK. And then save as just junk.fig. Yeah. Where is he putting it? He's just putting it in the Coulomb 3.1 directory, not in any of the subfolders. It doesn't really matter where you put it. But th what's here's the deal. If you double click on that file, it opens in MATLAB, not in Illustrator or Acrobat or something like that. So I promise you, you'll use this because it allows you to really uh, quickly see the full range of um, save. Yeah, and save. OK. And now I want to show you another three-dimensional representation of the file. And this one is a plugin. So what you do is you go to the MATLAB command window, which sometimes kind of gets lost on your screen. But in Shinji's case, it's just over there on the right. So we're on the bottom of page 25. Um. If you're wondering, we're on the bottom of page 25. So Shinji, if you would go to the uh, command window, and what you're going to write in the command window is earthquake underscore plot 3. Earthquake underscore plot 3. All right, so this gives another a 3D view, OK? Hit return. Now, it asks you a couple of questions. What did you say? And so it asks you if you should you. Can you be in the Coulomb 31 directory? Yes. See how it says command window? MATLAB command window. OK, so then answer to these questions, you can answer the first one Y and the second one N, but you could choose whatever you really wanted. That's just a graphic representation. And now, uh, zoom out, Shinji. It's now, there are a couple things really nice about this one compared to the last one, and there are a couple things not as nice. What's nice is that the earthquakes are now colored by their depth, and, their s and the size is proportional to their magnitude. And um, you can make them circles or disks. And you can change the proportionality with depth. And the third thing that I like about it is it has a magnitude scale you can see there. And as, if you move, as you move things around, that scale will always be readable. What's not as nice about this is that if you save it, it's a bitmapped file, not a vector file. So you're not going to get higher resolution than what you see on the screen. So it's got some pluses and minuses, but it's a very nice thing. Shinji, why don't you try looking down the faults? You mean just yeah, that? yeah, that kind of fun stuff, which we really need in life. <laughs> yeah. So you can change, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do to change in there. Maybe this is another good point. Go back to click the right mouse button. Right. And to go back to the XY view. Okay, now let's try an annotation. So go up to the... You're not, you're not worried. Shinji's worried. We'll see. <laughs> Go to annotations. Annotation is a way to label things. So if you choose overlay, annotations, and now you can put a name up there. So let's put Loma Prieta. OK. Delete this function. All right. <laughs> Shinji doesn't like this, but I think it's going to work. Say OK. And now put it up. That's the uh, right hand, uh, left hand corner of the label. So click where you want the label to go. All right. Did you get something like that up there? 
All right, now um, go to the swivel menu again and see what happens to the annotation when you swivel. See, I think that's very cool. It's always visible. It doesn't flatten. <laughs> so it's quite useful to do this kind of annotation within MATLAB rather than doing it when you send the figure to Illustrator or something later because it'll always be visible. Yeah, if we save this, let, if we save this as a PDF file, if, it's a good question. I know that if you save it as a PDF file, it'll, it will be bitmapped. I think if you save it as an FIG file, it'll be, FIG, FIG will be fine, right? Fine, yeah, but FIG you can only handle on the, in yeah. So you can always save this as an FIG file and open it again, but, you know, to get it into publication and, it's our goal in Coulomb always to shorten the time between research and publication. So what we're trying to do is make the figures as publishable as possible as quickly as possible. Because we all spend a hideous amount of time sprucing up figures um, that we really wish we were spent other ways. Yes? You'd think so. We haven't tried it. But You'd think so. Encapsulated postscript should be a vector format. The advantage, the reason why we like PDF, because you can also save it as an Illustrator file. And, but a PDF file can be quickly opened in Acrobat by just double clicking it, or you dump it onto Illustrator and you can open an Illustrator. And I don't think any layering is preserved, for, so I don't see any advantages of saving it as an AI file. EPS file is probably a little larger in size for the same information, but you could try it. What's that? Yeah. That's a very good point. Since I'm a Mac user, I haven't focused on uh, the, how easy it is to get into other types of drawing programs. But inevitably, you do want to be able to get things into whatever drawing program you're most comfortable with. So you could try EPS, and see, but you might just do that right there at your desk and save it as an EPS file and uh, one of these things and just see if you can open it into CorelDRAW that way. So uh, if you go to page, the bottom of page 26, we don't have to do this, but I just want to show you that there's also a plug-in capability to make maps of smooth seismicity as opposed to actual locations of earthquakes. Sometimes that's preferable for various numerical reasons or for the representation that you're looking for in a figure. And uh, it's easy to do with another plug-in. And that brings us to the end of the overlay plot. So I hope now you can see that you've made it, you're halfway through the manual, which is an incredibly exciting moment, and uh, that you've learned how to get files in and out, and you've learned how to add all these things that make the files more useful, so kind of where you know where they are in space. And so that's, you've accomplished quite a bit. And so the next thing that we're going to go into is deformation. But I think everybody should just kind of stand up and stretch for a minute. Because if you're like me, you kind of carry a lot of tension into your, as you're pounding away here, trying to, you know, keep up with the uh, dance chorus. So everybody should just stand up for a minute, you know, and just, just stretch before we get into deformation. Deformation is a lot of fun. We won't. Uh, I don't think it's here yet, but I think we should just make a little bit more progress in deformation. Uh, the lunch is here, Ross. Well, what, what do you think? You mean the, this file? This one? This one? Okay. But you say lunch is already out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, then I think we should stop. We, we yeah. 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 All right. Okay, guys. We've just made an executive decision that lunch is a better idea than just a stretch. <laughs> I don't know how they came up with that point. So um, what does that mean? It's 1225, and we'd like to get started again yeah, at uh, how does 115 <laughs> sound? One? That's too, t that's too short. It has to be civilized. Now, how this works is lunch is out there, and people.
people can bring it to any room around. You can eat at the table by closing your machine, or you can go into the other room over there, uh -huh. right? Is there any other room open? open. That, that, like, what about this room right there? Is that open? That may be locked. All right. You, of course you could be outside. That would even be better. I, I didn't see what the, actually, weather looks pretty good. Outside is best if you're dressed appropriately. Oh, yeah, one other important thing about lunch is I think as they serve you lunch, they will collect your $15. And that's, that count, that's for the lunch and the refreshments in the morning and the afternoon. Yeah, so basically what this means is we have to get deformation and we have to get into stress before we take the, the, the break. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much we should explain about optimally oriented. I'm, I promise. I'm going to do a very brief <laughs> explanation. I've, you know, I have experienced that many people request <laughs> how, how much stress we should assign.